This book is perfect for fans of Life with Derek. Like you wanted me to genuinely take this book seriously when she's writing letters to Ellen DeGeneres instead of going to therapy. I baked him cookies, so we smoked a joint and then I gave him head. Best girlfriend ever, until I killed him. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome. After months and months of waiting, we've finally reached this day, the day where I read the five most popular Colleen Hoover books. Ever since I started doing these reading experiment videos, this has been the one video people have requested far more than anything else. I put filming this off for a long time because I was heavily debating whether or not I even wanted to contribute to this conversation. The thing that kind of pushed me over the edge that made me finally decide to actually film this video was a couple months ago when I saw a New York Times article that mentioned that Colleen Hoover has sold more copies of her books this year than the Bible. I just knew it was my time to step in. If she's selling more than Jesus, I think it's fair game. <laughs> so I want to get a few things out of the way. First of all, if you don't know who Colleen Hoover is, congratulations, you've successfully avoided the most popular author of the past like couple of years. She's predominantly a romance and new adult romance writer. I think at one point she had nine of her books on the New York Times bestseller list. They might still all be on the New York Times bestseller list, at least several of them still are. And she's been around for some time. She originally started as like an indie author who was self-publishing I believe until she was picked up by a traditional publisher and now especially because of the rise of book talk her books have just become incredibly popular and they are everywhere you literally cannot go on any uh, book space on the internet and even in a physical space you can't go to a bookstore and avoid her books they are everywhere everyone is reading them everyone either loves them or they really hate them, and it's a pretty controversial topic online. Lately, especially on Twitter, there was some discourse about how people are saying that it's like a new thing to dislike Colleen Hoover, which is absolutely untrue, and to talk negatively about or criticize her books. People have been criticizing her work since 2016, when I was first on booktube. I saw criticisms of it back then. She's been writing for years and years, and the criticisms of her work are absolutely not just a new thing that's popping up. It's one of my biggest pet peeves that people like to say that disliking Colleen Hoover, criticizing Colleen Hoover's work, questioning why her work is so popular is pick me behavior. People being judgmental of other women and their choices and what they like to read. There's absolutely nothing judgmental about people questioning why work that centers abusive toxic relationships and romanticizes those abusive toxic relationships is popular. I think it's a really slippery slope. It's very dangerous when we start saying things like just let people read what they want to read. Um, it's just a book. It's not that deep. That's that like anti-intellectualism discourse and language and I think that attitude of like you can't criticize this because people just enjoy it like they should be allowed to enjoy it without any kind of critical thought is absolutely a dangerous way of thinking. I've enjoyed my fair share of work that is inherently problematic or things that I just watch or read just because I want to have a good time and not think about it, but that doesn't mean critical thought should never be applied to those things and that does not mean that those things are exempt from critical analysis. So I just want to make it very clear at the start of this video that Yes, I am reading these books by an author that I don't think I'm going to like. The intention of this was one, to entertain because it's something that people have asked me to do for a very long time, and two, just a genuine curiosity because I've only read one Colleen Hoover book before this, but I wanted to know what it is about these books that reels people in so much, that has captivated such a wide audience and makes them keep coming back for more when I've heard so much negative stuff about her work as well. I like analyzing the things that I watch and books that I read because I find it one, really entertaining, and two, I also think it's very important to know what we're taking in and the messages that we are being sent through the media that's being put out to us. So I think it is essential to talk about the harmful things that are represented in the media that we take in and to just have conversations about them. Like I've said many times, my purpose with these videos is to get people to see a different perspective than they might have originally had. I'm not telling you you're wrong or that you're dumb or anything. If you like reading these books, it's your prerogative. My entire purpose is to just 
point out what I see and the way certain things are represented so we can talk about them. If we're allowed to analyze why art makes us feel so much, how it can help heal us, we should also be allowed to analyze the ways in which it harms us. People love to argue that you should just be allowed to enjoy what you enjoy without ever having to think about <laughs> what the effects of what you're enjoying could possibly have on yourself or anyone else. And while yes, I do think you should be allowed to just enjoy things for the sake of enjoying them, I think you should also allow yourself to question why you enjoy things. I could genuinely make an entire video on this whole like wave of anti-intellectualism that has been ongoing online for quite a few years now actually, but that's for a different video and this video is long enough as it is, but I definitely just wanted to make that clear at the beginning of this video. Anyway, that out of the way, really quickly, the final thing before we get into talking about all the books, I do want to remind you all that my reading journal, the A Clockwork Reader reading journal, is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. If you want a perfect companion to your reading, you can track all of the books that you read, write reviews, uh, make little artistic little journal spreads in it, and keep track of a ton of other things. If you want to get one last minute for the holidays as a gift or before the start of the new year, if you want to start with a fresh reading journal for your reading for the next year, you can check out all the links in the description box below. It is always listed there. And yes, by the time this video is out, the reading journal is actually going to be a year old, which is super exciting. I can't believe it's already been a year. Thank you all so, so much for your support and your love with this one. It's been completely amazing and overwhelming. If you want to get yourself one or get a new one for the new year, um, the link is in the description box. But now with all of that out of the way, let's Let's finally get to talking about the five most popular Colleen Hoover books that I've read. So first and foremost, this video will contain spoilers for all of the books. So if you haven't read the books and you plan to read any of these, just know you will be spoiled if you watch that clip. So you can jump around if you want to watch ones that you don't plan to read. Or if you don't plan to read any of these, which would be my personal recommendation, <laughs> and you just want to hear all of my thoughts about them, feel free to watch all the way through. It's gonna be a long one. This video legitimately drained the life out of me. Uh, it's probably the hardest one I've had to make, easily the hardest one I've had to make. I'm still in shock that I actually read these. I was a completely different person before I read all these Colleen Hoover books. And now I know so much, like I understand some of the inside jokes within like the fandom. Like, please, I just, I need you all to be aware of the sacrifices I made. <laughs> Anyway, starting off, the first book that I read for this video was Ugly Love. I knew pretty much nothing about this one. I knew nothing about most of these books, but I knew nothing about the plot. I just knew it was a romance book, a new adult romance book, but it's told in dual POV uh, from our main character named Tate, who is a nursing student, and then the main male character named Miles, who is a pilot. It's almost nurse and cop, but it's nurse and pilot. So it's like nurse and cop adjacent, but technically not as bad, only in that sense. Okay, so I'm about four chapters into Ugly Love, and we have already introduced a Life with Derek situation. We have some step-siblings who uh, are gonna probably be in some kind of forbidden romance. So it's really fun. <laughs> this isn't the main romance in the book, so that's good. I'm assuming that this isn't even gonna be like a major problem throughout the book. Like, I don't even think this is gonna be my biggest issue. I don't even think this is gonna be my biggest issue. Honey, you've got a big storm. The reason I decided to start with this one is because I have heard just the worst things about this book. I don't know anything about it. Like, I don't know anything about the plot. I have no idea what it's about. I've just seen people say that this is one of their least favorite books ever. And like, a lot of people I really trust. So I thought I may as well start with the one that I think I'm gonna hate the most, just to get it out of the way, you know? <laughs> because then at least we can't go like down from here, you know? Like, we can only go up. I don't know how far high up we can go. I'm assuming not that far high up, um, but at least it can't get any lower than this. Hopefully. I may really eat my words. <laughs> I'm being presumptuous. I haven't even gotten more than four chapters into the book. It's not even terrible yet, apart from this um, Derek and Casey thing that's going on. <laughs> but I will be back to update if there is anything noteworthy, which I'm sure there will be. <laughs> well, I finished it. Um, that was terrible. <laughs> I... Oh, where do I even begin? First and foremost, um, my poor, naive, innocent, earlier self, who really believed that this entire book would not end up being about the step-sibling incest, 
You poor, poor soul. Uh, Cause the whole book is about the step sibling incest. <laughs> I don't know why that's not what I was expecting with this book. Um, I, I mean, at this point, that's probably exactly what I should have been expecting, but it wasn't. I thought this was a romance book between the two main characters. It is not. It is a romance book between the main guy and his stepsister. This book is perfect for fans of Life with Derek, that creepy incest Folgers commercial, and also Brandon and Callie from The Fosters. If you know, you know. I fundamentally do not understand how this has 900,000 plus ratings on Goodreads and over four stars. Uh, that is mind-blowing to me, which I feel like is going to be a trend throughout this entire video. I really do want to emphasize that I am going into these books open-minded. Like, I like a good romance book. I like a good emotional romance book. I, however, do not enjoy romanticizing incest. I also don't like the weird, uh, like, pro-life kind of undertones that this had at times. The weird attitude they had about having this child was uncomfortable at best. In context, basically these two 18 year old step siblings, they get pregnant, she's pregnant with his child, they tell their parents, like their parents because they're you know married to each other now because they are step siblings, they tell their parents that she's pregnant even before this. They never once does a conversation about an abortion or like, you know, what their options are come up. They just, I guess, decide that having this kid, even though they're step siblings, is the best option. And then when they do tell their parents, there's this one line where Miles, whose point of view the book is told from at that point, he says something about like her mom, his stepmom, saying that um, they can handle it, but he says it in like a condescending way and everyone knows what handling it means, like what that's code for code for an abortion, but she just doesn't want to use the phrase abortion. That's what gives me pro-life undertones to this book. Um, so wasn't a fan, wasn't a fan of the step sibling incest, wasn't a fan of any of it. The possessive language, the very, very juvenile writing style. There was this one part I remember from Miles's point of view where he's talking about Rachel, his stepsister, saying something like, Rachel loves me, I loved her. We loved each other. She wanted me. I wanted her. And it was like listed out like that. I don't remember the exact part. If you've read it, I feel like you'll know what part I'm talking about. So much of the book was written like that. And the writing just felt very immature. I don't really have a better word for it. Okay, hello. Sorry for the interruption. I just realized that I'd forgotten to mention the um, we laugh at our son's big balls line. If you don't know what I'm referencing, here is a screenshot for reference. Yes, this is a real line in the book. I'm sorry, I was too distracted to notice it while I was reading because immediately after this, they get into an accident and the son dies. It was a lot happening at once. But yes, everyone loves to laugh at this line on Twitter. It's very funny. I mean, it's really not actually funny at all if you really think about these two step siblings laughing at their infant child's genitals. Um, but yeah, it exists in the book if you want another example of the incredible writing. Yeah, that's not even the biggest problem. Obviously, we have much bigger problems, but it didn't really make for an enjoyable reading experience. However, it did make it extremely quick to read, which is, I think, one of the biggest draws to Colleen Hoover books. I think that's what people like about it so much. You can read these so fast. I read this in a few hours. Like, it was very quick. I listened to the audiobook. It's also not super long, and it's just really, really, really easy to digest. That is if you can digest step sibling incest, but apparently 900,000 people on Goodreads can, including myself now. I am one of these people. Oh God. <laughs> As per usual, I have a list of grievances, so I'm going to go through a few more of the ones that I haven't mentioned yet. Tate, the main character, the main female character, she is irrelevant to this book. The romance is absolutely between Rachel and Miles, the step-siblings. It's, it has nothing to do with Tate. Like, Tate is so unbelievably irrelevant to the entire story. I know that she's the main POV in the book, but she honestly didn't need to be there. The book's not about her. She is there to be a doormat for this man to work through his problems and for her to constantly just go back to him and uh, let him use her 
knowingly, it's consensual, but it is toxic as hell. She's basically just in this situation ship where he's told her from the beginning, I'm only looking for sex. I'm not looking for like a romantic relationship, like anything permanent. Don't ask me about my past. Don't ask me about our future. I want none of that. I'm just looking for sex. And she agrees, even though she knows she's gonna like him and she already does really like him. And every time that comes up, she somehow just convinces herself that it's gonna be okay again. He low key manipulates her a lot of the time and she just keeps going back to him. It's incredibly toxic. It's incredibly terrible. Miles is exactly the type of person I would tell all of my friends to stay away from. And that man desperately needs a therapist, but instead he found Tate and she becomes the vessel through which he works through his personal problems. Yeah, it's awful. I hated it. <laughs> I do not hate it as much as I hate Slammed. Slammed was so much worse. I think the reason is that at the very least, the romance in this book was between two consenting adults. Unless you consider Rachel and Miles because they were both children when this first started, like their relationship started and they were like 17 to 18 and in high school, but whatever, you know what I'm saying. One of them is not a teacher and a student. At least they were like around the same age. I think that's the only reason that this was like a little bit more okay to me, but that is not a high bar, not at all, because Slammed is one of the worst books I've ever read in my entire life. This I wouldn't say is one of the worst books I've ever, ever read but it could be in that category. I hated it. This is not a romantic book. This is a book about a toxic relationship. This is a book about an illegal relationship. This is a book about a very abusive uh, relationship dynamic. Oh, other random little tidbit that I just like hated. <laughs> the names in this book, I don't know what it is with some of these books and the way they name their characters. Literally the names of the characters in this book, Clayton, Tate, Miles, Rachel, Ian, Brad, Chad, Corbin, Sam, it sounds like the cast of One Tree Hill. <laughs> and this is coming from someone who loved One Tree Hill. <laughs> when I got to Brad and Chad, I was like, okay, I'm, I've had enough. <laughs> also, out of curiosity, has Colleen Hoover ever written a non-white character? Like, not even as the main character. Like, are there any non-white characters in any of her books? I'm not saying I even want her to write a non-white character. Like, stay in your lane. I feel like it would be bad if we were to get a non-white character. But I'm just curious if there are any. I know I've only read one book in this video so far and only two books by her total, but I've never once seen any sign of a non-white character in any of these books. I really don't think it's, I don't think it's gonna happen. And that might be for the best, honestly. <laughs> there was also a bit of like the male-female language, like a male who blah blah blah, or a female with blah blah blah. Like I hate when books do that. You all know that's one of my biggest pet peeves in writing. There was also like a lot of claiming language and so many times where she would use the word invade, like invade me during like sexual situations. It was just awful. I hated that, but I'm gonna read four more of her books now. So hopefully they're better than this, but honestly I have and I have no hope. <laughs> I gave this like 1.25 out of five stars. It's not as bad as Slammed, so it's not just a solid one, like or close to a zero. It's 1.25. It's very bad. Would never recommend. But seriously, if you're looking for some like Life with Derek fan fiction, try ugly love. <laughs> the second book that I read was November 9. And yes, I'm calling it November 9 because they call it November 9 in the audiobook. It's not November 9th, even though that's what I would have expected it to be. And I find it very annoying. But yeah, they call it November 9. This is another book I knew absolutely nothing about. This one I had heard like a couple things about when it had first come out around 2016, I think. And people just saying it was really, really emotional. That was really the only expectation that I had going into it was that it would probably be a pretty emotional book. Okay, so... November 9. I read it. I didn't like it. Nobody is surprised. <laughs> but I will start with the positives, okay? Because this time around there were actually a couple of positives. The bar is very low, but there were still, I can, I can give a couple of things praise. The premise. The premise was really interesting. This whole concept of they meet one day and then every year for five years they only see each other again on that day. And I think in the book they mentioned that it's kind of similar to like Sleepless in Seattle, or something which I've never seen and like some other thing that it was similar to. Um, but anyway, I just, I like the idea. I thought it was clever and like a really good premise for a story. That's about it for the praise. The execution, however, 
not the best. Here's my thing. Ben is legitimately just Joe Goldberg from you if you put attempted in front of the murder and added in arson to his repertoire. Like that's basically it. This man is a stalker and um, a manipulator and master deceiver. I don't care what message the book tries to push at the end and how it tries to make him look like he was a victim too. I don't care that your mom was dying from cancer and committed suicide. It doesn't give you the right to to then manipulate and lie to a girl and deceive her for five years. No one's forgiving you for that. I'm gonna try and talk about this in like a semi-chronological way. Let's just lay out the story. Okay, if you don't know what November 9 was about, I, I had no idea what this book was about. It's about this girl named Fallon who is um, trying to pursue a career in acting. Like her dad was a famous actor and she was an actress as a child, but then she suffers these uh, like third degree burns from a house fire that she was in. She's like 18 years old. So it was when she was 16. And ever since then, she hasn't been able to land acting jobs in the same way. She's trying to move on with her life. She wants to move to New York from LA and start her career over. At the very beginning, she's at this restaurant with her dad and they're talking about this. He's kind of like being a little bit mean to her and telling her she's never gonna make it essentially. And then this random guy, random, I need to emphasize this. He, she does not know who he is. He's just some random man. He comes up to her, puts his arm around her and pretends to be her boyfriend to get her dad off her back because he's like going on about how she doesn't have a boyfriend and she hasn't had a boyfriend in a while, blah, blah, blah. Like that's why he's doing it. He just pretends to be her boyfriend, but she doesn't know him, okay? Like I don't care how mad I am at my dad. I would never trust some random stranger, especially a random man who came up and touched me that I don't know over my own father. Like I, I would never, ever, ever do that. And it's not like she hates her father. Like he's really, really terrible or something. He's not the best, but like he's not evil and she trusts this stranger over him. That's red flag number one. Anyway, they start talking instantly. She literally invites him back to her house. She's known him for like an hour at this point. The way that is so unsafe Whatever, we, we can just ignore all of this, I guess, because apparently that's the only way you can read any of these books. <laughs> also, by the way, the first time that he meets her and sees her, instantly, the first thing that he starts talking about are her boobs and what color underwear she's wearing. Like he instantly sexualizes her. And I mean like completely sexualizes her from the second he sees her. Then he starts having this like weird thing where he's like fetishizing her scars because she has like the burn scars and she's super insecure about them. And then how does she get over the insecurity of the scars? Of course, it's because he tells her that she's beautiful. So now she's not gonna have the problems anymore. Eventually she just like gets over it, but it's, it's because he told her that. Cause apparently that's the only way that you'll ever get over your insecurities if a man tells you that you're beautiful with them. But anyway, that aside, she invites him over. He has this weird thing about her scars. He wants her to like show them, which is strange. You literally just met her like an hour ago. And then she's like about to get on a flight to go to New York like that night. And she doesn't want to give him her phone number because she made this promise with her mom that she wouldn't date anyone from the ages of 16 to 23. And since she's 18, she's going to be 23 in five years. So basically they come up with this plan that every year for the next five years on November 9th, which is that day that they met, they're going to meet up at that same restaurant and like reconnect with each other. In the meantime, they can date whoever they want. They can do whatever they want, but they're gonna like see each other again. It's very insta-lovey, but like they talk about that in the book and she loves romance novels. So there are references to like books and like she mentions her TBR. You can tell this book was written in like 2016 or 17. I don't know what year it was published, but I'm probably right. <laughs> He's also a writer. So he wants to turn this into a book and he wants to write their story. They go their separate ways. Then the book jumps forward basically like to that one day every year so we just see that one day for the next like five to six years or so and that's basically the gist of it so how much like emotion are you really gonna feel for these two people who see each other one day and they don't talk in between that's also like something i need to emphasize they don't have each other's numbers each other's emails they're blocked on each other's social media they have no access to each other except for that one day a year so how can you possibly fall in love like in love love with a person that you have literally seen like three or four times in your entire life and have never spent more than like 10 hours with i think by their like third time seeing each other fourth time seeing each other they calculate that they've spent like 23 hours total together like that's not a day 
that's insane and they're like so in love it's unbelievable it is so unrealistic and it is so over dramatic but like all of that is fine you know like i could ignore all of that i could just like suspend my disbelief have like a fun time whatever but you want to know the real problem the plot twist in this book the plot twist which was so predictable i literally knew from the beginning that this was going to be what it was it was such a cop-out the plot twist is guess who started the fire that burned fallon it was Ben. Ignore the angle change, my camera died because it is also tired of me talking about these books. Anyway, as I was saying, Ben is essentially Joe Goldberg. He lied to her for like five to six years about who he was, the fact that he knew who she was, the fact that he's the reason she has these scars in the first place and suffered like that trauma and also made her fall in love with him in the meantime. And then we just forgive him at the end. Hello, so a brief interruption because I realized I didn't fully explain the whole backstory with Ben and why he set this fire and everything. So essentially, um, his mother committed suicide and he finds his mother's dead body and I quite literally can't remember why but for some reason he decides it's because of her current boyfriend at that time who happens to be Fallon's dad. So then he goes there to burn down that house because his immediate response to his mother killing himself is arson. And yes, I understand you react to trauma in different ways but most people don't immediately commit arson. But Ben surely does and then um, he sets the house on fire, realizes that Fallon Alan's inside, uh, freaks out, his brother tries to help him out, and then his brother's like, well, did you not read her suicide note? And he's like, what suicide note? Because apparently when he saw his mother's dead body, he didn't think to do anything else except set this house on fire. So he didn't read her suicide note, then he reads her suicide note, finds out that the reason that she killed herself was because she actually had cancer, and she was dying from cancer, and she didn't want to have to go through chemotherapy, so she decided to take her own life instead so she wouldn't have to suffer that pain. So yeah, he just reacted prematurely. And then he proceeded to lie to Fallon about this for five years. And um, when Fallon's mom finds out about this, because she reads the manuscript before Fallon does, her mom takes the side of the man who burned her daughter over her own kid. So yeah, that's the backstory. That's everything that happened. Um, it's, it's wonderful. So wonderful. She reads his manuscript for his book and then a year later comes back to him and is basically like, I'm so sorry for everything that happened to you. I love you and we should be together forever. He deceived you for like six years. And we're just supposed to ignore that. Like we're just supposed to go on thinking that that's okay. I don't understand. Like again, the premise was so fun and it was good. It was like unrealistic, but like who cares? It's a romance novel, but this is unforgivable. You can't deceive somebody like that. That wasn't just some casual lie. That was like your entire relationship being based off of a lie. It's legitimately like if Joe was painted as the good guy in the show You or in the book, which I know of a lot of people apparently love to forgive his actions and say that he's just misunderstood. But like, I swear it's things like November 9 and Ben's character and forgiving somebody like that, who's doing the same thing Joe is doing just on a different scale. Yes, he's not committing murder, but he did commit arson. It's painting these people as victims, painting these people as um, just misunderstood and like forgivable that excuses behavior like that. And we cannot excuse behavior like that. It's deception, it's manipulative, it's just wrong. And it's just completely, completely unforgivable. Anyway, now I have like a few more notes that we're just gonna go through of things that just stood out to me that I thought were just absolutely atrocious. Uh, first of all, we have the Asian food line, which I saw this on Twitter before. I had no idea it was in this book, but what a pleasant surprise. So they're talking about their favorite foods because they don't know each other because again, they've known each other for like maybe a total of like four conversations at this point, not even four, like two conversations at this point. So they're talking and one of them says, what's your favorite food? And then this is the exchange. Pad Thai, what's yours? Sushi. They're almost the same thing, not even close. They're both Asian food. <laughs> that is so bad, that is so bad. Other thing I noted, his birthday is the 4th of July, which I consider a red flag. Oh, there was this really terrible line uh, where he's talking about his mom's suicide. And like, I understand when you're in an emotional state, having just lost someone, you say things you don't mean, you say things that you regret and like things that are bad, that absolutely happens. But this uh, did not feel like a thing he just said out of anger or out of sadness. This felt like something that the book fundamentally believes. He says suicide is the most selfish thing a person can do. Yeah, 
not a belief or an attitude I subscribe to personally and I think it's extremely harmful. Um, so didn't like that. Like I mentioned, he was obsessed with her scars. He absolutely fetishized them. Once you find out about the plot twist, it makes a lot more sense. Does it excuse it? No, but it makes a lot more sense why he's obsessed with her scars and it actually makes it a lot worse because now it makes him seem even more like Joe or more like, you know, like a serial killer stalker because he has this weird thing where he wants to like see what he did to her like physically and he's just like obsessed with them. It's very creepy. I hated it. Oh, then I also noted why is she so obsessed with incest adjacent things? Like why did the dad of Fallon, the main character, have to have dated Ben's mom? They had to have been dating and then he also ends up dating his dead brother's wife, his sister-in-law. You know, like why is there so much incest adjacent shit in these books? I don't get it. <laughs> and that leads me to my Colleen Hoover book checklist that I ended up making. I made a checklist of the tropes that are in literally every single one of her books that I've read so far. I've read three of them. Every single one of these has all of these in it in one form or another. First up, we have absent slash terrible slash dead father. That's in every single book. This one had a dead father and a like kind of absent, not the best father who gets a little bit forgiven at the end. Then we have an abusive relationship. Yes, I consider this an abusive relationship. Deception for five years is um, an abusive relationship. You cannot manipulate someone in that way. Predictable plot twist which ties into tragic accident that caused trauma. The predictable plot twist is always that some tragic accident happens and kills somebody or that someone was in on the accident or something like that. Like it's just, it is so, so obvious. Then of course we have insta-love. Every single one of these books is insta-love. Then we have someone is pregnant. Someone is always pregnant. Someone either gets pregnant in the book or is currently pregnant in the book, like when the book starts. There is always a child being born without fail. And then we have someone has slash dies from cancer. Every single book, someone has had cancer or died from cancer. Um, again, yeah, these are themes in every single book. Basically every single one of these books is exactly the same. It just uses like a different abusive relationship as the main trope, if that makes sense. So I'm, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Despite all of my criticisms, this is the one I've liked the most so far. I think it's because as far as the relationships go, this one was unfortunately the least problematic. I don't, I don't even want to say that. It, it unfortunately, it is the least problematic. Like no way am I condoning the way that he lied to her for that long at all. Obviously I despised it, but at least it's not step sibling incest and uh, he's not her teacher. Y you know, we've we got to start somewhere. Okay, the bar is very, very low. The bar is below hell. It is in like the core of the earth at this point. I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> anyway, I uh, hated that one too. This one gets like 1.5 out of five stars just cause I think it's a little better than Ugly Love. At least the premise is interesting and there wasn't incest this time around. So we've got to take what we can get. Anyway, uh, time to move on to the next one. All right, so the third book that I read was It Ends With Us and this is easily Colleen Hoover's most popular book. It's getting a film adaptation made by Justin Baldoni and it is the book that you will see everywhere. If you've never heard of Colleen Hoover, you have heard of It Ends With Us. This is the book I knew the most about by far out of all of the books in this video, but even with that I still knew pretty much nothing about it. All I knew was that it was about an abusive relationship, and I know people don't label it that way when they talk about it a lot of the time, but it is. It's a book about domestic violence, and that's pretty much all I knew going into it. Hello, so it's actually been quite a bit of time since I've updated in this video and continued to read these books. For you, it's not gonna feel like any time passed because I'm assuming you're watching this video all the way through. For me, it's been like a month. <laughs> um, I had to take a break. Anyway, it's been a bit, uh, but I'm back and I'm here to update on It Ends With Us. Uh, what do I say? I haven't picked this book up in like a month. I'm like maybe a quarter of the way through it, but I did take some notes from the very beginning that I just needed to update on before I continued reading, which is why I stopped. So let's just go through these very few things. I haven't read the author's note, but I have seen people talk about it before online because this is the book that I know by far the most about out of any of the books on this list. But people have mentioned that in the author's note, she talks about how this book is extremely personal to her and based off of some of her own life experiences. So I am going to acknowledge that and take that into consideration while I'm reading the book. But I also don't think that makes the book exempt from any kind of criticism. I just think it's also important to acknowledge the fact that it is a more personal story, I think, compared to some of her other stories. So I'm keeping that in mind. 
themed. But the first thing I just need to talk about because <laughs> I can't. <laughs> So all I really know about this book is that it's about an abusive relationship, but like aren't all of her books. But I think this one's at least acknowledged as an abusive relationship. And I knew that her name was Lily Bloom Blossom and that she's a florist because you all told me that on my reading five books I said I'd never read video when I was complaining about the name America Singer from the selection. You guys were all like, wait until you read, it ends with us and you meet Lily Bloom Blossom the florist. And I thought you were joking. Unfortunately, you weren't joking. That really is her name and she really is a florist. And I will give some credit to the book because they do make fun of that in the book. So there's a little bit of credit given there. However, it is still so embarrassing. Like Lily Bloom Blossom is the botanical equivalent of Cho Chang. Like I just, <laughs> I don't understand why you would name her that. It's, even if you're pointing out how dumb it is, it's still so dumb. And it just makes things a little bit unserious. Um, and adding to the unseriousness, she, <sighs> The book jumps back and forth um, in time from like the time the main character of Lily Bloom Blossom or Lily Blossom Bloom. I can't remember which order her name is in. It doesn't matter. <laughs> from the time that Lily was in high school and she was dating some guy named Atlas. I don't know that much about him yet. And then in like current day where she's dating this guy named, what's his name? I wrote it down, I can't remember, or I didn't write it down. His name is terrible. Ryle, Ryle Kincaid, which is, oh God, a terrible name. These names are all so bad. But anyway, she is dating some guy who's like a surgeon or something named Ryle, and he's definitely gonna be horrible. He already gives me such bad, bad vibes from the second you met him, he was, just as bad as all of the other main characters in her other books have been. Um, but I think this time we're actually gonna like consider him a bad person. I mean, I'm hoping if we don't, I'm gonna be very mad. But anyway, it jumps back and forth between present day where she's dating this guy named Ryle and in the past when she was in high school dating Atlas. And in the past, that perspective is told to us through letters that Lily is writing to, get this, Ellen DeGeneres. She's writing letters to Ellen DeGeneres and you want me to take this book seriously? <laughs> that is so embarrassing. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. It's so unbelievably embarrassing. First of all, that aged so poorly. Second of all, even without all of the like Ellen scandals that happened in the last few years, it's just so bad. I feel like that was Colleen Hoover's way of saying like, I'm never gonna write anyone gay, but I need you all to know that I support the LGBTQ community because uh, she loves Ellen. So that means I'm an ally. Like that's literally what it feels like the book is saying. Oh my God. I just like, I cannot believe that's a legitimate, a legitimate plot point. Like a thing that's just consistently happening in this book. I, every time it goes back to the Atlas chapters, I have to read another terrible letter to Ellen DeGeneres and I don't want to. <laughs> you know that TikTok sound that's like, oh, jump scare. Like that was me <laughs> when I found out she's writing letters to Ellen. Like what? You had to give me a trigger warning for that. That was a lot. Then um, the point that I stopped at, like I literally stopped right after this line because I had to update about it immediately because I'd seen this online but I didn't realize it was in this book and I just I can't believe this is in one of her letters to Ellen and she's describing Atlas and she is talking about this time that they were in like a, a farm or I don't know gardening or something in the backyard I don't remember what they were doing it doesn't matter but she says and I quote when he was wiping that cow shit on me it was quite possibly the most turned on I've ever been what is with romance books and cows what is the deal? Like, what's going on there? Is this a, like, specific kink that I don't know about? Because what the fuck? <laughs> Leave the poor cows alone. Leave them out of this. They don't need to be, like, oh my god. I just, I know that's the couple everyone wants to be together because I know Ryle's gonna be a manipulative asshole. I don't know if Atlas will be or not. Who knows? With her track record of male characters, probably also, um, but just comparatively less bad. But I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. What is with the cows in these romance books? I'm not even gonna consider this a romance book, but unfortunately it's categorized in the romance genre for some reason. Instant Spanish love deception flashbacks, but this, I. This is worse. No, objectively, I think this is worse. Maybe it's it's worse in a different way. There are two different types of bad, you know? But I finally got into some of the themes of like abuse and domestic violence that are present in the story. And it was just like very sudden. If you didn't know that that was what this book was about, I don't think you would really expect it. At least I wouldn't have expected it if I didn't know. But it really just comes out pretty suddenly. I don't know, we'll see. It feels like every other Colleen Hoover book so far and they all literally feel like exactly the same book uh, because all the characters are so interchangeable and 
so boring. <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna go continue reading it. I will come back and update if anything noteworthy happens as per usual, uh, but I don't really think anything can top uh, the atrocity of writing letters to Ellen. But yeah, anyway, unfortunately, let's keep going. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Did I hear that right? <laughs> I need, I need to go back. He said he already does, and that made me want to marry him even sooner. He made me promise to vote. He said I was allowed to vote Democratic, Republican, or Independent as long as I made sure to vote. We shook on it. <laughs> he made me, okay, 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 okay. They are talking about their agreements before they get married. They literally just run off to Vegas and get married because they're clearly like in a very uh, whirlwind type of situation at the moment. And like you heard that too, right? He made me promise to vote. Didn't matter if she voted Democratic, Republican, or Independent as long as she voted. So they don't even talk about, like, I, why am I surprised, actually? Why am I surprised? These are exactly the type of people who would not talk about politics before they get married. All you need to know about Colleen Hoover books is in that sentence alone. We will sacrifice our political beliefs, morals, and ethics all for the sake of some man who is probably abusive. 99% of the time he is abusive, or at the very least, he's creepy. And that's, that's literally just every single book. That's every single book. That's the thesis. That's the thesis of every Colleen Hoover book. The Colleen Hoover universe? The Colleen Hoover? Hoover? What? <laughs> These books are just, uh, <laughs> they're so conservative. And before someone comments and it's like, her books don't have any politics, they're not political. Everything is political. Everything is inherently political. You cannot separate art from politics. It's impossible. Every piece of art is inherently political and everything about her books has a very specific stance and it's easily, easily identifiable in every single book. I could tell you exactly what every single one of these characters would vote for, who would vote, who wouldn't vote, and which politicians they would vote for specifically. <laughs> like, it's so easy and a good majority of them are red leaning. Like, it's not even debatable. <laughs> At best, one of her characters is like a Hillary Clinton Democrat and thinks that she's a girl boss. It's the attitude of like, we don't care about politics. Oh, I could be friends with someone regardless of who they vote for. I don't pick my friends and romantic partners just based on political beliefs. I'm above that. Like that's that's the attitude of all of these books. That's who every single character in these books are. Like they are just <laughs> the worst. <laughs> and I hate the vibes. I hate it. I hate it so much. I actively avoid these people in real life. And the fact that I have to sit through five books about this exact same like archetype of person. <sighs> I don't know why I'd be surprised that that line would be in here because absolutely, like I said, these are the types of people who would never discuss politics before getting into a relationship. Except in this case, I really feel like Lily should understand. She idolizes Ellen DeGeneres, so she at least is an ally, you know? <laughs> I feel like she should care and she did care earlier a little. She even said when Atlas was talking about joining the military, she was like, why would you want to fight for a country that's never fought for you? And I was honestly taken aback. Like, good for you, Lily. Like, I didn't expect you to even think that way until Atlas said something stupid like it wasn't my country who didn't fight for me it was my mother who didn't fight for him like no your country is the reason your mother's also in this situation don't get me wrong like his mom's not a good person but the country didn't do anything for you either I didn't need the military added into this too that was the one thing that these books were missing and the only reason I was able to get through any of them was because there was no military propaganda and I wouldn't call this military propaganda necessarily but like I did not need a character to go into the military. That's like, it's my final straw. <laughs> but anyway, all I'm saying is that like, she clearly has some like social and political awareness, um, which makes sense for her character. But it just goes to show you how much the book doesn't actually care. It's just all for like the show of it. Yeah, anyway, just I, I listened to that. I needed you to listen to that just so that I knew that I'm not making all of this up. Um, yeah. Fun. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Ryle sucks. Knew that from the beginning, obviously. Um, I don't like Atlas either. Like, I don't really have a reason to like him. Like, are we just supposed to like him because he doesn't want her to be abused? Like, congratulations, do you want an award? I don't understand. Lily is so boring. Ryle's sister is so boring. Oh, also, uh, going through the Colleen Hoover book checklist, of course, we already have a pregnant person, which is Ryle's sister. So that's already checked off. Uh, we have abusive relationship checked off. We have 
absent or terrible father checked off. Oh, we have tragic accident that caused trauma. Um, that one, yeah, we already have that checked off. The only one I'm waiting for right now, I think is predictable plot twist. I mean, I don't know if you count Ryle being abusive as the predictable plot, plot twist, like if that's the only plot twist, but like predictable, not a plot twist, just the plot of the book. <laughs> we have insta-love, uh, we have a religious family. Yeah, anyway, everything is there. <laughs> I'm gonna go back and keep reading. <sighs> Let's see what happens from here on out. I don't wanna see what happens actually. I just, I wanna be done. <laughs> All right, so I finished It Ends With Us. Um, I'm glad that it ended. This is not a romance book. This is a book about domestic violence. Nothing about this could be categorized as romance. I am genuinely appalled and baffled uh, by the fact that anyone would ever classify this as a romance book. I don't know why you would put it on a romance shelf with other romance books. It's a book about domestic violence. It's a book about a girl in an abusive relationship who is trying to work through those emotions and eventually like get out of this relationship. That's the whole book. Nothing about it is romance. Like I just what is going through your head? This is closer to lit fic than it is to romance. But I'm gonna take it a step further because I see people mention this with It Ends With Us pretty frequently, but I don't see people talking about it with her other books as often. I'm not saying no one does. I'm sure plenty of people definitely do. But I guess when people talk about this, it just doesn't get as popular. So I'm gonna say it too, because I think we should all be talking about this. And I think this should be the general understanding of Colleen Hoover novels. Every single Colleen Hoover book is about an abusive relationship. I don't know why in Colleen Hoover's mind she has decided to label domestic violence violence as abusive, uh, which it is, but for some reason a teacher dating a student, that's not abusive. Step siblings sleeping with each other, that's not an abusive relationship. Dating someone for five years only to find out that they've been lying to you about the fact that they knew you from the beginning and are actually responsible for the fire that uh, caused all of your childhood trauma, that's not an abusive relationship. But domestic violence, yeah, that's an abusive relationship. We're gonna label that. Those are conversations we should be having because this is a situation a lot of people face, which I am not saying is a bad conversation to be having, not by any means. But I'm also saying, if you're gonna have that conversation and talk about how that's an abusive relationship, you cannot then go romanticize every other form of abusive relationship in all of your other books. What? Make it make sense. Make it make sense. No, he didn't hit her, but it's incestuous. And no, he didn't shove her down the stairs, but he lied to and manipulated her for five years and literally burned her physically. So it's still physical violence. You don't get to cherry pick what you label as abusive. And you can't write some books where you romanticize the abuse and then write other books where you depict the abuse as abuse. It's just all so hypocritical and it's infuriating. <laughs> and I genuinely think it's extremely damaging. And especially when your target audience is such young readers, I cannot tell you the exact demographic of people who read Colleen Hoover books, but I think I can make a fairly well-educated guess that it's probably mm, teen girls. That's kind of who I see reading her books most often online. That's the target demographic, I think, for a lot of romance and especially like YA adjacent books. And I know these aren't YA, they're more like new adult, but that's pretty much who reads these. And this is not me blaming those people. I have been a young teen girl who has been the target demographic for many of these types of books, many of these genres before. I know what it's like to read books like this and romanticize them when I was young too. Like for God's sake, I was obsessed with Twilight. I will always bring this up. I'm never trying to shame young girls for what they're reading and for liking these books. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is just point out the facts of what's in these books. And they want you to romanticize these things. They want you to make excuses for people like this. And people will try and tell me that it's not that deep. All I have to say to you is that it is that deep. There's a reason that you read a book and you feel an extremely deep connection to it and it makes you cry and it makes you feel all of these overwhelming emotions. It's because it is actually that deep. It does mean something to you. And conversely, that's also true. When you read something that is extremely toxic, extremely harmful, depicts an abusive relationship in a romanticized light, you will also take in that messaging if you are not aware of what you're actually consuming. And sometimes you can genuinely internalize it and then that can manifest in how you go out and experience the world, in what types of relationships you'll accept into your life. The messaging in these stories is extremely important, especially when the target demographic is fairly young, because it will genuinely influence you. And it can influence you for a really long time, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively, it depends. But when the stories are about very toxic, very harmful relationships that are not depicted as toxic or harmful relationships, it can really mess with your psyche. 
And that's why, that's why I think it's important to talk about things like this. I know all of the Colleen Hoover girlies are gonna get really mad at me and other people are gonna get really mad at me because they're all just gonna try and tell me that I'm sitting on my high horse thinking I'm superior to everyone because I don't like Colleen Hoover books. As if it's some new original take to not like Colleen Hoover books. I promise you, I in no way think that any opinion that I have in this video is um, super original or makes me morally superior to anyone. I just don't want a bunch of young people reading these books and having the wrong impression about what they're actually about. Because I've been that young girl, I have read those types of books, I have had them affect me negatively, and I don't want that to happen to a whole nother generation of people. And I know I can't personally stop it, but I will talk about it because I think it's extremely important to have these conversations because without these conversations, books like this can continue to get published and continue to get labeled as romance when they are in fact anything but romantic. Anyway, rant over. On to my thoughts about the actual content of It Ends With Us. <laughs> First thing I will say, this book is by far the best Colleen Hooper book I've read yet. The bar is unimaginably low, okay? But the reason that this book is the best one out of all of them is one, like I already mentioned, this book actually depicts the abuse as abusive. The fact that I have to give credit to the book for that is really, really sad, but I do, apparently, because the standards in this video are just very different. <laughs> that, and I will say, because this book comes from such a personal place and such a deep, like, personal understanding that she has about this type of a relationship, obviously it's coming secondhand through her mother's experience. You could feel that coming through the book. You could feel that in the characters. Not that the characters really had distinctive personalities, because none of her characters have distinctive personalities, but in the way she explored the themes, you could feel that it was extremely personal. So it was significantly, in my opinion, more emotional than her other books. Not emotional enough to like really make me cry. I didn't cry. I didn't really feel very much, to be honest, but I felt a lot more reading this book um, that wasn't anger. <laughs> I felt a lot more emotion reading this book than I did with her other books because uh, you could feel that there was like a uh, genuineness to it. But that for me wasn't enough to make up for the rest of the book. It was really boring, honestly, overall as a story. Um, it wasn't until like the second half that things really start to happen emotionally with the characters or that there's any development whatsoever. So I was really uninterested for a while. And the writing was just your very standard coho writing. The line that everyone loves to point out, besides the cow shit one, <laughs> the like, if you happen to find yourself able to fall in love again, fall in love with me, that line. I personally didn't care. I don't care about Atlas. I didn't care about that aspect of the story either. In my opinion, the writing in her books is just a bit too bare bones for you to really ever get that deep into any kind of conversation. And I think what this book really, really suffered from is the fact that so many elements in it were so unserious when the story itself was actually extremely serious. And that juxtaposition was just really jarring. So. I couldn't take a lot of what was happening seriously. Like, you wanted me to genuinely take this book seriously when she's writing letters to Ellen DeGeneres instead of going to therapy? You want me to take this book seriously when she names her child? Her child's middle name is Dory because Ellen DeGeneres plays Dory in Finding Nemo? Like, that's so... Listen, I'm not one to like judge things for just being cringy because people are enjoying themselves and having a good time. Like have a good time. I'm cringy too. Everyone's cringy. Be cringe. That's okay. But like this is not even cringy. This is, are you not ashamed? <laughs> are you not ashamed <laughs> that you named your child after a character Ellen DeGeneres played in a children's movie? And like the thing is, why does she like Ellen so much? Like, what is the reason? I would get it a little bit if there was like, I mean, it's just the fact that it's Ellen is just inherently really embarrassing, but like, I would get it if there was some kind of like explanation for why she feels this particular connection to Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> yeah, it would still be cringy, but like, at least you could understand the character a little bit better. But it was just randomly thrown in there, and I literally feel like it's because she wants us to know that she's actually an ally, but you know, without doing any kind of work. <laughs> but in the most like casual, nonchalant, non committal way, you know? <laughs> like, she's just like, I don't hate gay people. See, this is proof. I love Ellen DeGeneres. I feel like she was like, let me find a gay icon who is genuinely 
just disliked by the majority of the queer community, but loved by straight people. And I'm just gonna use her. This is like the equivalent of if like a character was like, I love black people, BLM. My favorite person in the world is Beyonce. Like <laughs> literally, it's just such a cop out. Like it, it feels so disingenuous and so uncomfortable. And that's why I keep calling it embarrassing and cringy. You know what's genuinely cringy? This level of performative allyship. Like it's so bad. It's, it's so obvious. Why would you obviously point that out? Like you may as well just have not included the Ellen thing in here. It would have changed nothing and it actually would have made me like the book more because then I wouldn't have to be sitting here constantly just like shaking my head and having to close the book because I'm so embarrassed that I have to sit here and watch her write letters to Ellen DeGeneres. And then making her child's middle name Dory was just the cherry on top because oh my god. <laughs> there was one thing in this that I personally just didn't like in terms of like the discussion around domestic violence and that's just the way that Ryle was treated in the end as a character. After reading the author's note I understand like why she made the decisions that she made. She talks about in the author's note how this is not meant to be like the example of what this kind of a situation is like for everyone and Ryle and Lily are not meant to be perfect or perfect examples of how you should treat someone in this situation, um, if you should or shouldn't forgive them. Like she does make that fairly clear in the uh, author's note. And also I understand that both of these characters are very uh, much influenced by her own parents and um, she based a lot of them off of her own parents. So again, it's extremely personal. So I feel kind of weird judging anything about the relationship itself because obviously she's just writing about a very personal experience. However, this is not a nonfiction book. It's fiction. And as fiction, we have to judge it as fiction and not as nonfiction. You know, it's different when someone's writing their genuine, just personal experience. But there was just like this bad taste left in my mouth with the way that Ryle's almost forgiven. He's just painted out to be an extremely sympathetic character in the end, which it does add to the complexity of the story. I just think that it's not clear enough sometimes. Hello, pardon the interruption. I just wanted to clarify what I was trying to say at this point because I ended up cutting myself off. Ryle never really faces the consequences of his actions and I feel like the book doesn't make it clear enough that he was incredibly abusive. It's too sympathetic and too forgiving towards him at times in a way that's just not nuanced enough sometimes and when you read the author's note it really makes this very evident. It feels like the book forgives Ryle. I just felt like there was too much gray area and especially in a book that is about a really heavy subject but it's actually being marketed as romance, I feel like you have to make that extremely, extremely clear. Like there should be no question about whether what he had done was wrong. And you can tell that that is the case, that it is kind of a gray area because if you read reviews of this book, you can find reviews where people think that Lily was in the wrong for divorcing Ryle, think that Ryle is the sympathetic character, think that Ryle didn't actually do anything wrong. And that's, that's where the issue comes in and that's what I have a problem with because the whole thing was about how it ends with us, right? Because she's ending the cycle of violence with them, like in this family, she's not gonna let that cycle of violence continue. But to me, nothing about that ending actually ended um, the cycle of violence. If we're gonna talk about this from like a philosophical standpoint, more so than like one personal uh, narrative, in order to end a cycle of violence, the person who enacts the violence has to be held responsible for the violence. And that doesn't happen in this book. Leaving him, don't get me wrong, that was the right choice. Um, leaving him didn't end the cycle of violence because no one actually holds him accountable for the violence. Nobody else in his life holds him accountable for the violence. And that's the thing that like gets me. <laughs> I get it for like her personal narrative, yes. She's like, I'm not gonna let this continue. And no, I don't think she has to take him to court and like suffer through the violence of going through the court systems to deal with custody and like all of that stuff like that's a, a violence of its own. To me um, this book does not have the language or the scope or the, even like the length <laughs> to actually you know tackle that as like an issue of ending cycles of violence. She's trying to write a book about ending cycles of violence but actually only just telling a very personal narrative so it just like it doesn't cover that aspect of it. So in so many ways this book just felt like nonfiction, like personal narrative, because it, it really is. And if you read it as that, I think it works a little bit better than if you're trying to read it as like genuine fiction 
especially if you're trying to read it as romance, don't read this book as a romance. It's not a romance. I will say that till I die. <laughs> but yeah, personally, I would never recommend this book. Do I think it's extremely deep and emotional? Personally, no. Do I think that people who have experienced this type of violence or this kind of a relationship might deeply relate to it or it might resonate with them? Possibly. It can also be very triggering, so just know that if you decide to read it. Yeah, personally, me, Hannah. Would Hannah recommend it? No, I would not recommend it. I think there are better books about domestic violence. Memoirs you could probably read. Other fiction books you could probably read. I don't have any recommendations on hand, but if that's what you're looking for, I'm sure you can seek it out. If you're looking for a romance book, don't read this book. It's not a romance book. Nothing about this book is romantic. That's pretty much all I have to say on It Ends With Us. But yeah, I think I'd give this book like two out of five stars, maybe like 1.75. Definitely the highest rated, and I think it will remain the highest rated of all of the Colleen Hoover books. That's all I really have to say. I'm gonna go read the next book now. Probably, most definitely, suffer through that one too. So, wish me luck. <laughs> All right, so the fourth book that I read was Reminders of Him. This book was her newest release out of all of the books in this video. It came out in 2022, and I, again, knew nothing about this book. All right, I finished Reminders of Him. What is there to say at this point? <laughs> this one confuses me, and I think it's because the main relationship in this one is not an abusive relationship. So I think I was kind of surprised that I wasn't sitting here reading about step-siblings falling in love or um, some guy gaslighting a girl for five years. But for once, uh, we didn't get an abusive relationship at the center of this romance novel. So um, I was a little, I was a little surprised by that. And ultimately, I think in a good way, uh, I still didn't like the book though. <laughs> this one, I think, overall is just objectively the least problematic of all of the books I've read so far. But again, the bar in hell. I really don't know how to talk about this one, so I'm just gonna give you the plot summary, we're gonna go through the major plot points, and then I'm gonna give you my list of grievances that is, once again, extremely long. <laughs> so what is Reminders of Him about? We follow our main character, Kenna, who is 26 years old and just got out of prison after serving a five-year sentence for involuntary manslaughter or vehicular manslaughter. I think it's involuntary manslaughter. What happened was she and her boyfriend were driving in a car. She was the one driving. They were both drunk and high and she crashes the car, the car flips over, she is able to get out, she thinks that he's dead, so she leaves him there, and then goes back home, and then the police come to her door and arrest her, and then after that she finds out he actually was not dead, he was alive, but because she left him there and didn't call anyone for help, he died. So that's why she went to prison, and also because she did not defend herself, because she felt guilty and she thought that she deserved to go to prison for what she did. Right after she gets to prison, she finds out that she was pregnant, and uh, while she's in prison, she ends up giving birth to her daughter, who she names Diem, which is the first item on my list of grievances. She names her daughter Diem, after the phrase carpe diem. Anyway, Diem's paternal grandparents, the parents of the boyfriend who she left for dead, <laughs> end up becoming the child's guardians, and they take Kenna's parental rights away from her while she's in prison, so she's not allowed to see her daughter. So the book starts off with when she just got out of prison, and now she wants to see her daughter, so she moves to that town where they live, because she wants to see her daughter. And so this whole book is basically about her trying to um, find a way to like see her kid. And obviously in the meantime, meets someone and then within like three seconds wants to sleep with them and falls in love with them like every other Colleen Hoover book. But in this case, that guy just so happens to be the best friend of the boyfriend who died in that car accident. Of course. <laughs> the book is told in dual POV, so we get Kenna's perspective and then, get this, his name is Ledger Ward. <laughs> Ledger Ward's perspective, the best friend. And even though the premise of this book is supposed to be about Kenna trying to get her daughter back, which a good part of it is about that, that's not what it's about. It's about her trying to resist the fact that she literally just wants to sleep with this guy, which is really not gonna go over well because he's heavily involved in the daughter's life and is basically like an uncle to her. And your ex-boyfriend's parents hate you and want nothing to do with you. They eventually get a restraining order against her too because they don't want her near their granddaughter. And despite the fact that that still upsets her, like the most pressing issue throughout this entire book is the fact that she wants to like be with him. It's so dumb. <laughs> Anyway, that's basically the plot of the book. So it's mostly just her trying to uh, get rights to see her daughter without actually doing anything, you know, except for like crying in her room and uh, banging on people's doors, chasing people down in parking lots. That's really it. 
that like that's the whole thing and like yeah i feel bad for her like it's sad that she has to go through this but also like i don't care because that wasn't even the main point of the book it, it was so so dull <laughs> now we're just going to go through the rest of my list this is not going to be in any kind of chronological order um it doesn't really matter you don't need a chronological order the book didn't make much sense anyway okay i remember this like early on when she was talking about in prison like the fact that she hasn't slept with anyone in a while and um she hadn't kissed anyone in a while stuff like that except she mentions that she had like a casual like thing with one of the prison guards the prison guards and then justifies it by saying she wanted it and he didn't even though then they transferred him to like a different prison because that's literally an abuse of power did none of you watch Orange is the New Black? Which we'll get to that in a second uh, because later on she's trying to get a job and um, she wants to work at this grocery store and this girl who kind of becomes her friend who's her boss at the grocery store ends up hiring her because quote she loves Orange is the New Black and wants her to tell her about it to let her know if any of it's like realistic. That was so bad. It was so embarrassing. I swear to God Colleen Hoover just watched Orange is the New Black and was like hmm I wonder what would happen if one of them got out of prison and none of them were gay. <laughs> so at the very beginning of the book, she goes to Ledger's bar. That's like one of the first things she does when she goes into town. She has no idea who he is, but she's just sitting in this bar and she's all sad because she just got out of prison and she's in this town now and trying to find her daughter. And Ledger like notices her and like the first thing he notices is how hot she is. He like makes note of that very clearly, but also notes that she has uh, no interest in any of the guys at the bar. Like she's not there to hook up with someone or meet anybody. And he clearly takes note of that. And then what does he do? try to get her attention and try to get her to hook up with him because that's what he wants. And I just need to point out how hypocritical and ridiculous this is because at the very end of the book, the most embarrassing thing that happens in this entire book is at the very end when Ledger and um, McKenna get together, they are like talking about something or like they're about to hook up or something. I, I don't even remember. It doesn't matter. And then he just super casually slips into the conversation. He's like, I have to tell you something. I read books about feminism, <laughs> so I don't compliment women on their appearance because I know that can be detrimental to their self-worth. Something along those lines. He says something like that. And I literally could not stop laughing. That's so funny. <laughs> And this ties into what I think was probably my biggest problem with this entire book. Kenna is trying to get like people on her side, right? So that she can have the ability to see her daughter, win over people's trust and prove she's not a terrible person so that she can be able to see her daughter and have like a role in her life. And so she tries to do this through Ledger because Ledger is basically like an uncle to her daughter and is very involved in her life. And she thinks if she can win him over, then he can have influence over her boyfriend's grandparents and give her the right to see her kid. I know need to make this so clear. The only reason, the only reason that Ledger gives her the time of day is because he thinks she's hot. That's literally it. The whole premise of this hinges on that. And that's what makes this so horrible to read. <laughs> I just need every person who reads this book and thinks, oh my god, Ledger is amazing. Ledger is a feminist king to understand that fact. He only changes his mind about her. He only thinks that she deserves the right to see her daughter and thinks that she's worthy of forgiveness because he thinks she's hot. If she was ugly to him, he wouldn't care. The second that she came and was knocking on the grandparents' door and he drags her away, he literally just would have left her. He would have left her, driven her away, told her to never come back here, and never spoken to her again. The only reason he keeps going back to her is because he wants to sleep with her. That's it. I don't know what else to tell you. That's the whole fucking book. <laughs> the fact that he legitimately only feels like she has this right because he finds her attractive is honestly a very realistic thing. I think that's a thing people experience um, a lot throughout life. Like people always wanna act like pretty privilege, thin privilege, things like this, white privilege, uh, light skin privilege are not things that exist, but they are very, very much things that exist. And I feel like this book is a perfect example of that. She has this privilege. She is given the benefit of the doubt time and time again by him because he is sexually attracted to her. <laughs> I rest my case, like I don't need to tell you anything else. If you want to read a book about um, a woman who's trying to get custody of her child and is only given that right because she's pretty, 
read reminders of him. That is obviously Ledger's number one red flag to me because that it, that's just the worst. Like I promise you, I promise you, replace her with a non-white character, a fat character, just anyone who's not conventionally attractive. And even, even if she was not conventionally attractive, if he didn't find her hot, he wouldn't have cared. And that is the worst type of person. The worst type of person. Ledger, technically speaking, cannot be that high on my list of fictional men in Colleen Hoover books that I hate because some of the other ones are literal just abusers. So it's really hard to rank them. Um, but like objectively, personality wise, if we're taking out like the extreme actions of some of the other characters, he'd be high up there. Cause my God, atrocious. I hate people who are like that. I hate it and ugh, you could just feel it the entire time. It was gross. Red flag number two for Ledger, he's a professional football player. We all know how I feel about professional football players. I don't need Spanish Love Deception 2.0, thank you very much. Oh my god, another... <laughs> I don't even know what, what to call it, what adjective to use to describe this sentence. I'm just gonna read it to you. I baked him cookies, so we smoked a joint, and then I gave him head. Best girlfriend ever. Until I killed him. <laughs> to laugh otherwise I will just cry through all of these and not for the reasons that most people are crying in Colleen Hoover books but just because I can't tolerate them. Oh my god even more terrible lines so she basically writes letters to uh Scotty that's the name of her boyfriend that she killed. She basically writes him letters to work through her feelings, explain things to him, kind of how Lily Blossom Bloom would write letters to Ellen DeGeneres. Um, she writes letters to the boyfriend that she murdered. <laughs> I keep saying murdered. It was an accident, but you know what? This has to be like more fun. It was really boring, okay? Like it would have been more interesting if she legitimately murdered him and was trying to like get forgiveness from these people. That would have been more funny, but no. <laughs> anyway, she writes these letters to Scotty and um, sometimes she writes really bad poetry. And I'm gonna read you one of her poems. I have a daughter I have never held. She has a scent I have never smelled. She has a name I have never yelled. She has a mother who has already failed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if I had to read it, if I had to hear that, you have to hear it too, okay? I'm so done. <laughs> Listen, the thing is, the like subject matter of this book is objectively pretty sad. It is sad having um, a mother who was in prison who never really got to have a relationship with her daughter trying to have this relationship with her daughter. I'm not trying to make light of that. Like that is inherently sad, but the book was just ridiculous and overdramatic. It genuinely felt like they were using this sad situation as kind of a backdrop to add more drama for why her and Ledger couldn't be together. Like they were using it as a prop, honestly. It wasn't even an integral part of the story. You could have come up with another like dramatic reason why they couldn't have been together. You didn't even need the child involved in this situation at all. Actually, if she had just killed the boyfriend and then was trying to be with the best friend, that would have been enough dramatics. But they had to add in the child for like that extra layer of like depressing content. It wasn't depressing, it was a background prop. Another thing I found really ridiculous, the first First time that he um, meets Kenna and is like making out with her, she lies and says her name is Nicole because she doesn't want anyone in this town to know who she is. But he's making out with her. And the thing that really gets me is he doesn't recognize her. How could you not recognize the face of the woman who went to prison for the death of your best friend? I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how much she like changed her appearance. Like he says he didn't recognize her because her hair is a different color and she was wearing different clothes and wearing different makeup. Like that just proves to me how little men pay attention to anything. Because what do you mean you couldn't recognize her? How could you not recognize her? Did you never look up her mugshot? I know they didn't meet before she went to prison, but you don't have to meet her. Did you not go to the trial? It made no sense. <laughs> they, and they tried to explain it away by saying, oh, she dyed her hair. Dyeing your hair does not change your whole physical appearance. Especially when it's someone that you've had this much anger towards for like five years. Someone who's been the person who's been your villain in life for the past five years. You're, you're telling me you're not gonna remember her face? unrealistic so unrealistic <laughs> oh my god so i feel like this book was colleen hoover's attempt at being diverse because 
Remember when I mentioned in the clip for Ugly Love um, how I was curious if Colleen Hoover has ever had a non-white character in her books? We have a non-white character in this book. I stand by my original statement. I think it would have been for the best if we didn't have any because it genuinely felt like it drained her to put this in there because it was so forced. Girl, just don't include anything. I don't need it. No one needs it. It was a hypothetical question earlier, okay? We don't need it because when you do include it, this is what happens. She has one black character in this book and like mentions a couple of other characters who I don't even think are named. They're just like background characters who are Latino or uh, black. There's one character in the book, I think his name is Roman and he's black, but of course he is a recovering alcoholic or drug addict. And then she also included a character with Down syndrome. They don't really go into that at all. They just like mention it, which like, sure, I'm not saying we need full descriptions of this character. But I think in this book, that element of it, her trying to add in this diversity probably because she's received some criticism about it, I don't know, or maybe she genuinely wants to make an effort. If that's the case, I would recommend, um, you know, working on developing your characters in general before you try adding in characters you have no experience writing about, because this really, really emphasized how underdeveloped every Colleen Hoover character is. Every character is literally just a trope of something in all of her books and they have no personality whatsoever. They just have like one traumatic event that happened to them and they are that trauma. They just represent that. There's nothing else to them. I can't give you a distinctive personality trait that Kenna has, that Lily has, that any of the other main characters, Tate, um, even the male characters, Miles, Atlas, Ryle, like any of them. I cannot tell you a specific quality that each one of those characters has that makes them distinctive of the other main characters because they are all literally exactly the same. This book I feel like really really highlighted that. When she tried to introduce some diversity into her universe you can clearly tell how none of these characters have a single defining personality trait. I, like, can someone please point out to me what the difference is between Tate and Lily and Kenna and whatever the other girl's name was in November 9 Fallon? Can you tell me anything distinctive about their personalities other than their jobs? They all have different jobs and they all live in different cities and maybe they have different hair colors, but nothing else about them is different. They're exactly the same person. And that was one of the things that drove me crazy in this book because Ledger would constantly talk about how Kenna is such a good person. She's so kind and so intelligent and so hardworking and all of these things, but he's one, known her for a month. Two, he has no basis for any of that. He doesn't know anything about her because the reader doesn't know anything about her because they've explained nothing about her to us. So we have no idea who she is, what she's like. I could not honestly tell you if I think that she should be allowed to be in Kenna's life because I think she's a good person. Do I think she has rights to see her? Yes, but that's a different story. But like based on her as a person, I could not vouch for her as a person because I don't know her as a person. Because we don't get to know her as a person because Colleen Hoover didn't write her as a person. She's just a shell of a character that's placed there to move the place plot along. That's it. That's what every Colleen Hoover character is. And that's why these books read so much like fan fiction and why they read so much like Wattpad fan fiction, like self-insert fanfics, because that's what they are. <laughs> like she just sets up this dynamic and scenario where these two characters could fall in love and then gives them nothing, no personality, no defining traits, no goals, no fears, nothing, and then expects you to self-insert. That's, I think, why people like reading them so much, because you're just like reading about romantic situations. You're not actually reading about people falling in love. And I think that's what it is. I, I'm like, as I'm reading these books, I'm trying to figure out what it is that really draws people to her books, because it's not the writing, it's not well written. It's not character development. There's no character to develop. It's not the plots. The plots are predictable and boring. I think it's the fact that there's so little of all of those things. And there's just like this idea, like the concept of romance that is so bare bones that you can just genuinely completely immerse yourself into this like fake scenario. It's like someone writes an outline for your imaginary scenarios that you make up before you fall asleep at night. Someone has already given you the outline so then you can lay there and fill in the blanks. I think that's what it is. I think I've cracked the code. I'm sure there are plenty of different reasons why people will say they love Colleen Hoover's books, but I think even if that's not what people are actively thinking, I think that's what it is because there's so little here. Unfortunately, what is there is really bad, but in terms of like creating like a story, there's so little there and I think that's what draws people in because they can completely just 
fill in all of those blanks for themselves. But yeah, she includes this entire paragraph on diversity and talks about how I'm pretty sure it's like at his bar, he has like employees who aren't white. And she finds that so amazing. And she's like proud of him and happy that he does that. Because if he deserves an award for hiring non-white people, oh my God, this is like the same thing as in Ugly Love when she found out that uh, Miles didn't care that someone thought he was gay. She's like, oh my God, he didn't care. Like, please give him an award. I, it's so bad. That was her attempt at writing in diversity. Like, it was so lazy. So lazy. Anyway, continuing on with my list of grievances, there's the other part where Ledger is talking to her about um, how he was engaged to someone up until very recently and he was supposed to marry her, but then broke it off because she said that when they have kids together, she wants him to pay more attention to their kids than he does to Diem, the daughter of his dead best friend. And he was like, no, she's gonna be as important to me as our kids would be. And his fiance wasn't okay with that. That, so then they broke up and he tells Kenna this story and then Kenna's literally like she's such a bitch Like of course you think that that's your child You want everyone to love her more than any other child in the world But if you were the mother of these other kids and he was paying attention to someone else's child Would you also feel that way? It was just so mean these books are also very girls hating girls e. And also I hope people notice this but uh, none of the main characters the main female characters have friends who are girls Actually, they have no friends at all, but they never have friends who are girls in it ends with us She's friends with her abusive husband's sister, who I think she was friends with before she met him. So there's kind of that, but she's also her employee. So, you know, they never have friends. None of them ever have friends. And I'm like, that's why you all get into these terrible situations because you hate other women and you don't have anyone there to help you through anything. Because literally all of these books are about placing men above themselves and just placing romance and romantic love in a heterosexual context above all else. That's what literally all of these books are about. And it's so painful to read. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, then we get into um, her explaining like what happened that night, which I already explained to you all uh, with the car accident. Everyone hated her because she didn't defend herself in court and they thought that she just didn't care that she left him there to die. They thought she was just like apathetic towards him. I don't know why you would assume that. Like it's very clear that she was just traumatized by the experience too, so she couldn't say anything about it. But anyway, she like reads the letter she wrote to Scotty about what happened that night to Ledger and then Ledger gets all mad, not at her. He's just like angry at the emotion that he's feeling and like the fact that he hated her for so long and when you like read that letter personally that made me hate her more <laughs> hearing that you just left him on the side of the road regardless of what was going through her mind would not make me feel better it wouldn't make me feel better but whatever ledger just wants to sleep with her so he doesn't care and immediately after hearing this extremely emotional letter they hook up because of course <laughs> And then the grandparents find out about him and Kenna being together and obviously they get really mad at him because like what he's doing is really terrible. You know that these people do not want her in their grandchild's life and regardless if that's right or wrong, you are loyal to these people. Like they care for you, they care about you like you're their son and their son was your best friend and you're heavily involved in their grandchild's life and he's constantly betraying them, showing her videos of her kid, basically giving her access to her kid in a way that they have not given him the right to do and that's terrible it's their choice to make not his he's not legally allowed to have any say in this child's life yet he's making all of the decisions for her another red flag for him another reason i can't stand him and again despite the fact that i also think kenna should have the right to see her child it's not his decision to make that's the problem so yeah they find out about it and understandably get really mad at him and the grandfather like makes an ultimatum and it's like you have to choose either kenna or diem and he chooses diem because he always says diem is the most important girl in his life blah 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 but then he gives them Kenna's letter that she wrote about what happened that night and has them read it. And instantly, five years of animosity, five years of anger and resentment and everything they've felt toward this girl just goes away because they read this letter. That is exactly the events that happened that night that they already knew about. Only this time they realized that it wasn't that she hated him and didn't care about him. It was that she was so sad she couldn't like do anything about it. And they just like forget about it. Like, I don't know about you. But it would not take me one single letter after five years to be able to forgive the person who was responsible for my son's death, regardless of if it was intentional or not. I'm not saying she does not deserve forgiveness ever. I'm just saying it's one letter, one single letter that 
honestly didn't really give me much new information anyway, would not change, would not change that at all. I would still feel so angry. I would still feel so upset. And it would take me much longer than literally like 20 minutes to change my mind. Yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, that's pretty much it for reminders of him. I wasn't a fan. <laughs> Like I said, for me, this one, the biggest problem was the fact that the only reason Ledger was ever willing to give her the time of day was because he thought she was hot and he wanted to sleep with her. We have to be so completely honest about that because that's exactly what was happening if he didn't find her attractive. None of this would have happened. She would have had to leave and she never would have been able to see her kid because he never would have listened to her. So yeah, it was awful. I think I give this one like 1 1.5 out of 5 stars. It's kind of in some ways equivalent to it ends with us in my head. It ends with us is only like a little bit above it because I think there was like some genuine character work done in that book. Whether I liked it or not is a different case, um, but there was like actually something there versus this one. There was a little bit of it there, but not really. That's why it's above some of the other books. Also because the relationship technically wasn't an abusive relationship, it made it easier to read at the very least, which again, the bar. I don't have to keep saying it. <laughs> anyway, I have one book left to read. I am not looking forward to it, but at least it will be a little bit of a change because I am so sick of these unromantic romance books. I can't take it anymore. I need a change of pace. All right, and finally, the very last book that I read in this video was Verity. Verity is probably her second most popular book after it ends with us. This is another one I see everywhere. I knew nothing about it other than it was a little bit different because this was like a mystery novel. So I knew to expect something a little bit more than just romance. But apart from that, knew nothing about it, had no preconceived notions going in other than my experiences with the past four Colleen Hoover books. Okay, hi, final book. I'm so happy. <laughs> I can't even tell you how elated I am <laughs> that I'm almost going to be finished reading all of these books. I'm not even finished yet, but I'm already so excited because <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait until I don't have to read them anymore. <laughs> but anyway, on to Verity itself. Right now, I'm a little bit more than halfway through the book and it's different. I say that, but also it is just kind of a, like thriller mystery with a lot of smut. Like that's 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 all the book has been so far. I even hesitate calling it like a thriller. It's not thrillery. It's like a mystery novel, kind of. It's pretty graphic at times, almost borderline horror at times. And you know what this actually weirdly reminds me of? And maybe I'll look some more into it after I finish the book because I don't want to spoil myself for anything. But is this based off of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier or even Jane Eyre? Because I'm getting very strong Rebecca vibes. Basically the book follows this author who is hired to be the ghostwriter for this other famous author named Verity because she was in a car accident recently and she's basically completely like immobile. She can't speak, she can't move, she can't do anything. She's almost in a coma except she's awake and so they want to complete like a series that she has or something and so they hire this other author our main character to be her ghost writer and um, she basically moves into Verity's house with her husband with Verity's husband Jeremy the fact that it's Verity and Jeremy it just reminds me of Jeremy Baramy. If you've watched The Good Place, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, she moves into their house. And so it really, really reminds me of Rebecca because she's living with this man basically who she clearly has feelings for while his wife, even though she's not dead in this one, is kind of haunting them. It's very much like Rebecca. Like it's just the like, store brand Rebecca. <laughs> That's like the general premise. And um, while she's like doing her research to ghost write these books for her, she ends up stumbling upon this memoir that Verity is writing about her life. And uh, being the like nosy invasive bitch that she is, <laughs> decides to read this uh, manuscript that she's been writing. That's about very personal details of her life. And it depicts her in a very bad light. Like she's a psychopath. Like she has almost like no empathy. She also had two daughters and she also has a son but her two daughters died and her son is still alive but there's just like kind of weird circumstances around their death and also weird circumstances around her accident and through this memoir the main character who has a name in this I just don't remember her name <laughs> she ends up finding out that Verity kind of resented both of her children. She hated them and potentially could have like killed one of them or something. So yeah she like doesn't like her and um, I mean the memoir 
paints her out to be a very bad person, don't get me wrong. But like, I obviously a plot twist is coming because this is a mystery novel. I'm just gonna call it right now. The plot twist is that her husband caused the car accident that has nearly killed her and potentially that he's the one who's been writing this memoir in the first place to paint her out to be this terrible person because he's trying to like trap her here a la the woman in the attic in Jane Eyre or the ghost of Rebecca from Rebecca because it's literally just the same story <laughs> except really poorly written <laughs> with a lot of really cringe, uncomfortable, unnecessary smut. We'll see if I'm right, but I fully believe that I'm right. Like the husband's responsible. There's no reason she'd be reading this memoir and 100% Verity's gonna be the one who who's behind everything. That's one too boring. I mean, I don't know. A lot of these books, a lot of the Colleen Hoover books have been very like blame women-y. So uh, maybe that is what she's gonna do. Either he found out that she hated her children. So he decided to try and kill her because he loved his children, which would be kind of boring. Or he's the one behind the memoir itself. And he like made up like an evil persona for her or something because he hates her for some reason. And is trying to frame her as this terrible, horrible, unloving woman who was willing to kill her own children and then tries to kill her and then make it seem like she's faking her injuries. Like that's probably what's happening. I feel like I've seen so many people talk about how this book was so shocking and they were terrified. Nothing about this book has been scary so far. The worst part was the scene where she's describing trying to choke one of her daughters to death. That was really, really awful and gross. But besides that, nothing about this has been scary. It's just been boring smut and a very unsuspenseful mystery. I hate every character. The main character is terrible. She's a horrible person. I don't know why she keeps blaming Verity, thinking Verity is a horrible person. I mean, obviously if she's reading just this um, memoir, manuscript, whatever. Yeah, she's not a great person, but also you literally came into this woman's house to do a job and now you're fucking her husband while she's dying upstairs. Like maybe get your priorities straight before you start judging her because I thought that I would be at least a little bit intrigued by the mystery, but at this point I'm just reading to see if my theory is correct because I'm like 99% sure that it is correct and I just want the confirmation, but I'm genuinely not invested. Um, so that's a little disappointing, but also completely unsurprising. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I finished it. I, I literally have nothing to say, except this book is just Walmart brand Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. It's as if you took Rebecca, but then stripped every piece of meaning that is in that book from it and then added in a lot of sex. That's exactly what this book is. I promise you, like, I, I don't even need to do a review. If you want something like this book, if you read this and you thought this was good, let me help you for a second, okay? Go pick up the book, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Read that. Read that because this book wants so desperately to be that book. I'm not gonna spoil Rebecca for anyone who hasn't read Rebecca, but since I'm talking about spoilers with this book, the canoe, the fact that she drowned her daughter, or if you believe the other side didn't drown her daughter. If you've read Rebecca, you know how significant the boat is to that story. Same thing. There were so many parallels to Rebecca. There was the nurse who I think is supposed to be kind of like the Mrs. Danvers character. Obviously Jeremy who's like Maxim. And then the main girl whose name I literally don't remember. <laughs> but in this one, she actually has a name unlike the protagonist in Rebecca. It's exactly the same story, except really, really, really watered down. Stripped of all of its meaning, stripped of all of the depth, symbolism, and just anything good that was present in that book. And then add in a ton of excessively boring smut and that's it. That's the whole book. It was terrible. Hello, quick interruption because this was something that I forgot to mention while I was filming that clip because I was too distracted by the whole Rebecca comparison. But I did want to touch on the smut, which I mentioned was really bad. I do also want to mention that it's not just that it's cringy and uncomfortable to read. There's at least one scene, I can't remember if there's more, but there is at least one scene that includes S.A. There's literally a scene that Verity describes in her manuscript where she tries to have sex with Jeremy while he's asleep. Yeah, I think there's another part too, but quite honestly, I didn't skim those scenes while I was reading it, but I blocked them from my mind like the instant I read them. I remember another really terrible one where she's talking about like, how she feels like disgusted breastfeeding her children, which is not a problem inherently itself, but she feels disgusted breastfeeding her children because it makes her think about Jeremy. Like, I don't even want to explain it. Like, it's just really, really bad. It was horrible. So when I say the smut was awful, I mean it was 
awful, like genuinely awful. I also feel extra upset by this one because Rebecca is literally one of my favorite books of all time. So I'm just very upset. This was horrendous. <laughs> what a way to end the video. <laughs> I remember before I started reading this book, Katie was excited for me to read this one because she wanted to know if I was gonna be team manuscript or team letter, and I had no idea what that meant, and now I understand what that means. I literally couldn't care less, first of all. <laughs> Hello, back again because I wanted to clarify my point here with the whole team letter, team manuscript thing. After having sat with this for over a week now, I think I've finally come to my final conclusion and I I don't even think that it's a theory. I think I'm right, like this is 100% correct. <laughs> because of Colleen Hoover's track record with how she writes female characters and how she depicts women who are not deemed the good women in her books, i.e. women who want to be mothers, women who don't outshine their husbands, women who are submissive and docile, based on the way she represents those women and the the women who are not the main characters, Verity has to be evil and the manuscript has to be true. And I found an interview with Colleen Hoover where she actually confirms this. Was the letter real in Verity? I wrote Verity from Lowen's perspective. And so at the end, you know, when Lowen was confused, I was confused. And I know people don't believe that, but mm -hmm. I really was. When I was writing that, I was like, oh my gosh, what is real? What is not? But if I had to pick, I think, I think Verity is evil. I really do. <laughs> so as you can see, it, it's not a debate. Like it, she didn't put that in there for some like clever thing to make her readers try and figure out which one was true, which one is like not true, who's lying, who's telling the truth. The letter's just there to reinforce to you that Verity is awful, unfortunately. I want to say, because that was my original belief that uh, Jeremy is responsible because um, I don't trust men. Like why should I trust Jeremy? I have no reason to trust Jeremy. At least I can sit there and pick apart her manuscript and pick apart her letter and decide for myself what I think could possibly be true. Jeremy's given me no reason to believe that he's a good person. All we have is Verity's account of his behavior and his personality and also the main character who is completely unreliable because she just wants to sleep with him. So she has a very skewed view of who he is. And the only thing we've seen him do is kill his wife. So why would I trust him? Like, that's common sense. <laughs> we didn't see Verity kill her children or do any of the things that she describes in that manuscript. We also didn't get to see any of the things that happened in her letter, but I did observe that man kill his wife. So if I'm going off of what I can see, uh, yeah, no, uh, why would I trust that man? He's gonna kill the main girl too, probably at some point. It, I just, uh, anyway, that's my stance on that. The book is finished. I hated it. <laughs> this literally gets a solid one star. The more I think about it, probably genuinely my least favorite book in this whole video. It's even named Verity after her. Like, are you kidding me? Do other people consider this Rebecca fan fiction? Because they should if they don't. It just really bothers me because <laughs> Rebecca's such a masterful novel. She does such a wonderful job of making every single character in that book completely unreliable, completely morally gray. You cannot trust anybody. You don't know who's telling the truth. The reader doesn't know who's telling the truth. The characters don't know who's telling the truth. The narrator doesn't know who's telling the truth. She's unreliable. Every character is unreliable. And it's done so, so well. And this book literally was just like an unseasoned version of that. Rebecca is like the well-made marinated meal. Seven courses, beautiful plating, seasoned to perfection. And Verity is like the raw chicken, okay? Like it's just night and day. I can't fathom how anyone could possibly pass this off as a, a well-written thriller. Nothing about it was thrilling. I was not on the edge of any seat. The disrespect to Rebecca <laughs> is inexcusable. <laughs> But yeah, one star, terrible ripoff of one of the greatest books of all time. And just genuinely, if you read this and you want something similar, but something that's, you know, actually quality, read Rebecca and thank me later. There you all have it. That is it. Those are the five most popular Colleen Hoover books and all of my opinions on them. When I tell you that my soul has literally left my body, that the life has just been drained out of me, I mean it. This was a new experience, <laughs> uh, one that I would never recommend to anyone. <laughs> in this video, I'm gonna do something a little bit different than I've done in some of the other experiment videos and kind of give you a little bit more of an in-depth final thoughts 
segment to the video and talk about, you know, my overall thoughts about Colleen Hoover and her work that I've read thus far. Hopefully this will be the last Colleen Hoover book I read. I don't plan to ever read more. Please do not ask me to. I don't know if I can take it. First and foremost, I want to go over a finalized version of the Colleen Hoover book checklist because I added a couple things, changed things here and there, but just know Every book, every single one of them has all of these in it. First up, we have the absent slash terrible slash dead father. It's usually both dads actually that are the worst, but at the very least, one of them will always be terrible or dead. Second, central to every single one of these books is an abusive relationship, a toxic relationship. Apart from reminders of him, which technically wasn't like an abusive relationship, it was just kind of weird and he was definitely toxic, so we can still kind of count it as one of them. But for the most part, most of them center abusive relationships. Like it's not just like, oh, he was kind of mean. Like he's a bad person and he's manipulating her either emotionally or physically. Three, we have a predictable plot twist. And again, that usually ties into number four, the tragic accident that caused trauma. There is always a tragic accident. It always caused the main trauma in the story. It either happened before the story began or it happens at the climactic point of the story. Five, we have insta-love. Every single romance in every single one of these books is insta-love. And there's always just like instant romantic or sexual chemistry. Six, someone is pregnant. There will always be a pregnant character or a character will get pregnant. Usually a character will get pregnant. So there's like a real emphasis on like motherhood and childbirth in all of the books. Seven, someone has or dies from cancer. Sometimes it's not cancer, but it's some kind of like disease that kills somebody. But typically there's always a character with cancer in it. This checklist can also kind of work as like a trigger warning list. And then eight, the characters are always religious, uh, specifically Christian. Christianity is like a very central, like, I don't even want to call it a theme. It's just embedded into the stories. These books are very much told from a Christian perspective. And then number nine, the main female character never has, first of all, any friends, but more importantly, she never has female friends. These books are inherently, for a number of reasons, incredibly misogynistic, but I think one of the main things that makes them so misogynistic is the fact that the female characters are almost always either pitted against each other or there just aren't any other female characters apart from the main character. I don't think any of these books pass the Bechdel test. I should have done that as like a test throughout this video, but I really don't think that they do. And I don't even think that's a standard we should hold everything to, but I, I don't think there's like any scene that I can think of where two female characters sit together and talk to each other about something that isn't the main man or her father. And apart from that, if there is another female character in the books, she's either the crazy ex who is just a bitch or she's kind of the main character's friend, but no matter what, in some way kind of sides with the main male character who's abusive, which a lot of the time that ends up being the mother figure in the books. Like in November 9, the mom sides with the terrible stalker boyfriend. And in Verity, Verity is obviously the villain and completely vilified and just made out to be like a toxic, abusive woman who is just jealous constantly. So yeah, like apart from the main female character, the messages these books send out about women in general is I think incredibly toxic and incredibly misogynistic. This video was really hard for me to make, not just because I hated reading these books and I thought they were bad, but also because I wanted to give you all like, you know, some kind of like analysis of what I was reading, some kind of like critical thought about what I was reading, but it is really hard to give critical thought on something that has no critical thought put into it. So it was really frustrating trying to like think of anything to say. In summary, the only thing I can really tell you about these books is that they are one, not romance novels, and poorly written misogynistic stories that romanticize abusive and toxic relationships, tie in a lack of any sort of depth in either theme or character development or anything, and you have a Colleen Hoover book. Add any of the things from the checklist that I made and you essentially have a Colleen Hoover book. And they're not different from one another. You just pick and choose your like main trope or main type of toxic abusive man you want to center the story around and then that's it. That's the only thing that's different about all of these books. You're reading the same thing over and over and over again. And like I said earlier, I really think the thing that draws people into these is the fact that they lack so much and it's just an outline for you to then self-insert and imagine your own romantic scenario. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say, but I hope you all enjoyed watching it. I hope you got something out of it at the very least. I'm gonna go read a bunch of books I really love because this was miserable, so I want to enjoy 
enjoy my reading for the remainder of the year, even with the few days that we have left. Please let me know in the comments down below any of your thoughts on anything that we discussed today. Um, and if you'd like to follow me on any of my social media, all my links are in the description box as always. Don't forget to check out the reading journal in the description box again. But thank you all so much for all your love and support throughout this entire year and on all of these videos. I hope you've had a good time watching them. I'm excited to continue making more. But again, thank you all as always. I love you very dearly and I will see you in my next video. Bye!